Welcome to the Everything Apartments podcast. I'm your host, Eric Christopher. I'm president of WSC Realty Advisors here in Long Beach, California, where I've been an apartment broker, owner, and property manager for the last 15 years. This podcast covers all aspects of multifamily investments from buying and financing properties. We also cover day-to-day operations and management and also into reinvestment strategies to help you increase your net worth. First, I want to remind some of the newer listeners, perhaps this is your first visit, we have a whole bunch of back episodes we recorded this year. This is our 16th episode. I encourage you to scroll back in your podcast and take a listen to some of these. We've got some great guests like we do today, covering a lot of different topics. Some of the episodes we've done cover out-of-state apartment markets, I've been studying and visiting a lot of those over the last year or so. And today we're going to talk about Utah. Now, Utah is obviously a pretty large state, but for the apartment discussion, that primarily is the I-15 corridor running between Provo and Ogden. And Salt Lake City is directly in the middle of that, and that's kind of its hub. Today we have with us Mark Jensen, who is one of the top multifamily brokers in the market with Colliers International. Mark started his career in 2004 after receiving a BA in marketing from the University of Utah, and he's been at it ever since. Over the last four years, one of the top uh, renowned brokers in the market, he was recognized as one of the 50 under 40, which is an award that a real estate magazine you've all seen, Real Estate Forum, awarded him back in 2017. Mark is married and a father of three girls and just loves the outdoors. And obviously, Utah is an outdoor playground, loves skiing, mountain biking, but his favorites are tennis and trail running. Mark, thanks for being with us today. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Great. Great to have you. So as I mentioned in your bio, you started right after college, 2004. What was it, maybe while you're in college, a family member or a friend that was already in real estate? Like, how did you get started doing what you're doing today? Yeah, great question. And uh, so my dad was actually the CFO of one of the largest uh, residential mortgage servicing companies in the U.S. It was called Mountain States Mortgage. And at the time, you know, when I was a kid, so I was probably 13, 14, they had $2.8 billion under management and they were just based here in Sandy, Utah. And that meant nothing to me at the time other than I had my 12C financial calculator on my desk, you know, all throughout college because of my dad. Um, in college, I managed cell phone stores. And then at night, I actually made, I made calls for refinances, for residential refis. So the, I've always kind of been around finance. I've always been around sales um, and, and just sort of naturally wanted to be in, into real estate. Um, out of college, I actually went to work for my uncle, who owns one of the largest commercial flooring contractors by volume in the Western U.S., um, and I hated it because I'm a control freak. And if you've ever dealt with flooring, you know that it either doesn't get installed right or the colors aren't there. Or you don't have enough product. So I, I told my uncle, like, man, I'm really struggling because, you know, there's so much outside of my control and I want to deliver for my clients. And he sat me down and gave me, you know, great advice for anybody, which is, hey, you're 24 years old. You just graduated. You know, you don't have a family. You don't have a wife. You don't have a mortgage. Like, if you're going to do something, you know, now is probably the time to do it. And I always loved real estate, so fought my way into commercial real estate. I'm grateful to have some, you know, good friends who are still my really good friends that got me got me an opportunity. Uh, and then I didn't make money for 14 months. You know that sort of that sort of story. So I understand but. that. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I also appreciate back earlier on before the flooring started, you were on the phone. You were calling people that you didn't yeah. know, pitching them ideas, and 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 that's a talent. That I mean, if you started early, it's like everything else. But a lot of people in the world cannot do that, right? So you started that early, got comfortable introducing yourself, pitching an idea, um, and I'm sure that's helped you all the way through. Yeah, no, no question. And you know, finance drives our world. And, and I always say I've always called on purpose. You know, if you call and you ask for something, you're probably not going to have a whole lot of success. But if you call with, like you said, an idea and you plant a seed and you're doing it from the right place, from your heart, you know, looking to help people. Um, it's amazing what, you know, can happen in your career. So. Excellent. Excellent. Glad to, that's, that's a great philosophy to have. Um, so I took an exploratory trip over there about two months ago. I pulled as many comparables as I could find. And I explored the box between Ogden to the North and then Provo to the South. 
and I looked at a ton of prop. I looked at every single one I could over two days. I think actually I was there like a day and a half and I looked at like 75 properties. It was, that's all I was there to do. Right. And it appears Utah County, which for people that don't know envelops Provo, it seems like that's in a pretty high growth mode as an example. Can you kind of give me the nuances or maybe the differences of what the markets are like between Ogden on the north and going down to Provo with SLC in the middle? Like, what are the differences there generally? Yeah, awesome question. And we're getting into the, the nitty gritty. I was going to say, I thought you were going to say the difference between your market and Long Beach and Salt Lake City. Um, Salt Lake City is great. Um, if yeah. you want to get into the in the, the very basics of you know how to invest in real estate, you just count people, right? And Utah has been number one in population growth for decades and will continue to be there. So it's pretty easy to invest in a, a market like Utah because you know that we're having enough babies and 22 years later, they're going to be renters. But there are some differences between the markets. I mean, Ogden historically was much more blue collar. It was railroad based. Um, and Salt Lake County was kind of the, the, you know, sort of the commerce and the hub and the business center of, of, of our market. And, and Provo was, you know, historically just sort of a bedroom community to, to Salt Lake City. And, and those are decades old thoughts, right? I mean, since, since then, Ogden's become its own great place to live. You know, Salt Lake City's grown and certainly become a bigger economic hub in the Western U.S., if not the world. Uh, you know, companies like Goldman Sachs have, have landed their largest, you know, their largest back office in the world is based here in Salt Lake City for reasons we can go into if you're curious. Um, but Provo and Utah County and, and Orem, They've really exploded the whole Silicon Slopes and the tech world and all the tech investments. You know, one of the best things about Utah in general is we have Utah State that, gra you know, that has 100, 100, well, let's see, we graduate about 125,000 undergrads a year between Utah State, Westminster, University of Utah, BYU, and UVU. And then we also have, now they call it uh, uh, Utah Tech, which used to be Dixie down in St. George. We have a lot of universities that graduate very bright, young, educated, multilingual people. Uh, in our market. And that's another reason why we attract so many great young companies and why there's such a great tech startup scene. And, and Utah County has really benefited from that, that tech growth and a lot of that education that comes out of that market. So the Silicon Slopes is, that's Utah County kind of running north from BYU. I mean, or I don't know if there's an actual geographic footprint of it, <laughs> but I've, I've, I've heard a lot about that. Um, and that sounds like a, a huge economic driver for that county. Yeah, no, no question. I mean, and we can go through the beginnings of it, but WordPerfect was founded in Provo, right? And WordPerfect had babies and those babies became things like Omniture that became Adobe. And, you know, out of all these great, you know, early tech companies came all of these other tech companies. Um, and, you know, it, it just, you know, that's sort of where that Silicon Slopes comes from is we've just had so many incredible tech companies and now larger tech companies from other markets have either put back offices here or, you know, move, move their, their work here. So yeah, big tech explosion in Utah. And that's definitely been here a long time, longer than most people probably realize. I mean, when was the last time you heard somebody say word perfect, but um, <laughs> it, it's, it's been here a long time and it's, it's going to continue to stay. It's definitely a great part of what makes our, our economy strong and, and fun, you know, moving forward from here. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, so kind of dovetailing into that, Let's say over the last five to seven years, or maybe 10, just to encompass sort of a, a market cycle or when you noticed the uh, upturn in, in, in your market. For example, here in Long Beach, we hit the top in 2007, hit that great recession, went into the doldrums, relatively speaking, until about 2012. Like 2010, 11 were rough, and we We've been on an uptrend since 2012, parabolic level from say 15 to 18. And now it's sort of shelved off as just if you took a look at price per square foot or cap rate over here in Long Beach. Give me just a couple things on when you saw a paradigm shift in the market, maybe something like your rent growth or transaction volume. How has that been kind of affected over like the last seven to 10 years? Yeah, well, I think Utah is interesting, um, you know, and to sort of track what you just walked through in Long Beach. I mean, I started brokering in 2004 and thought I couldn't lose, right? 2004 to 2008 <laughs> were great years. Then all of a sudden it was like, well, here you go, young guy, we're going to hand your ass back to you. Uh, <laughs> so, Same so here, man. Same here. Yeah. So 2009 and 10 yeah. and 11 were, were unique, unique years. I actually handled the majority of the FDIC disposition in our market in 2010 and got really, really lucky landing a pretty awesome account to keep me afloat. 
But similarly, values in 2011 and 12 started to climb back up, but we really didn't hit kind of 2007, 2008 peak pricing until probably 14 and 15. So in 2012, we started seeing a lot more development. I think that's really been the story of our market is we have added, you know, close to 40,000 units since 2012, 2013. And we really, that's a new city. When you're talking about Salt Lake County having a base, when I started of maybe 100,000 units, and, and you're adding, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 over a decade, it's been a really big add. And those have definitely been absorbed. Um, from, a, from a volume standpoint, I mean, I remember in 2017, you know, we were bragging about almost doing $750 million in multifamily sales in our market. This year, we'll, we'll probably do close to 2 billion. So we've definitely seen the volume grow up. We've seen the product type grow up. We've seen the market grow up. And, and it's certainly become much more institutional based on some of those larger you know, asset types. But we, uh, we've definitely grown up and we've definitely rebounded tremendously. To say that you know, Long Beach has tapered off, you know, I'd ask if it's because of political headwinds. Um, we do not have those in our market. We're a right to work state. Uh, you, know, you can evict with a three-day pay or quit and a 30-day notice to vacate. We've been, you know, during the downturn in 2009 and 10, we had zero apartment foreclosures in the entire Wasatch Front. And people don't believe me when I say that, but there was not anything of any substance over 12 units was not foreclosed on. There were a few foreclosures, but they were business. They were like related to business people that had gone south that, that had personally guaranteed loans and such. But as far as like market apartments, you know, no, we had zero foreclosures there. And if you look at during COVID, we were actually 98.5% collected through COVID and we're normally 98.5% collected. So we are, we are what I call a low beta you know, investment state or city. We just have very little downside here um, and certainly upside through you know, the growth that we've kind of talked about. It's interesting. You must have seen somehow my outline because I was going to get into a little bit of that government and legislative environment. So let's, let's take a click back real quick, just broad stroke. Let's say uh, a cap rate comparison between I don't know, 2015 and 2020. What do you think it what do you think you were selling buildings for 2015 versus 2020? I mean, I would say, I mean, we've probably kind of been, I'd say we were probably five-ish back then. Um, but really the story has been rent growth, you know, in addition to the cap rate compression, right? And you've seen that in your market, but our market's seen tremendous rent growth. One of those metrics being kind of tough to gauge because we were adding so much brand new product to the market, right? So uh, we had you know, back then we just didn't have as many class A apartments. So if you, if you look at it from like a gross rent standpoint, um, not sort of pulling out the C's and B's versus the A's, we, you know, the A's have really brought our average rent up. Cap rates have compressed, you know, to sub four pretty quickly in our market. And, and they're even getting compressed even further down. And we've had some three, four, sevens, some three, two, fives. I mean, I sold a two a few years ago, but that's because they were way below market rent, but mm. it's all cap rates are all relative, right? But in theory, our market has a lot of upside and people recognize that with little downside. And, and uh, so we, we haven't quite seen a slowdown in, in my opinion, compared to some of the other markets. In fact, the last 90 days, I would say we've probably seen an increase of anywhere from 10 to 15% in, in price appreciation because there's so much capital looking for safe places to hedge against inflation offer up, you know, a nominal return, but really not to lose money. And Salt Lake City is a great place to do that. No, it, it sounds like it. And, and some of the other markets I've visited have sort of echoed the same sentiment, you know, with this influx, not just of California only, because I, you know, I'm privy to the idea that you've got capital coming from the eastern side of your state as well. You put something out there that's, you know, within reason on price, uh, you're going to get 10 offers in a week. And one guy down in Tucson told me, said, if it's, <laughs> if it's on the market more than two weeks without getting a boat full of offers, there's something wrong with it. I mean, is that kind of the same idea here when you put it out there, it's just like blood in the water as far as uh, interest? I, I think it depends. I mean, interestingly enough, I mean, I probably know too much because we do so many transactions, but you know, kind of in those smaller deals, we're actually seeing less transactions and less 10 to one exchanges. So call it $3 million and below. Unless you're doing it for tax purposes, depreciation reasons, or whatever, have to close by year end. But but over say 100 units in the institutional space, yeah, it is absolute blood in the water. I mean, my joke to most of our listing pitches is you could put your property on Craigslist and sell it. You know, like we're really good at what we do, and you kind of need sort of our process, and the information that we have. But you know, the reality is that most of our clients know what the market is because they have six LOIs sitting on their desk from the last few weeks just from buyers directly. I mean, there's there is a hunger to to get into this market. 
what's weird is we feel like we're late cycle, but at the same time, if we were day trading the data that we're receiving, it's, it's all buy options, right? People are trying to buy in the Utah market right now. So I'm sort of anticipating additional growth uh, in, in valuations over the next you know, six to 12 months in Utah. If I'm hearing you correctly, the institutional side is a feeding frenzy as far as uh, buyer demand. But you know, most of the people listen to this, my client base for the last 15 years is the smaller private family investors, let's say, you know, uh, capping out at, let's say 10 million, probably more so around five to seven, as far as they're, they're trading out of something over here, that's like two and a half or three, and just hypothetically bringing it over to there. So you're, if I'm hearing you right, the traffic on the buyer side may not be as fervent on the smaller stuff. I'd say it's price sensitive. I mean, certainly over the last five years, the vast majority of my clients might be listening, right? They're from Southern California or LA based or something. Um, but, you know, and if you could sell at a three and buy at a four and a half, it, it made a ton of sense. And then you ha- add the political wins to it. If there's any, you know, if something is, is going to stop your property from appreciating like rent control, then even if you take a, you know, a, a, a cash flow straight across to, to a Salt Lake City or to a Boise or to a Denver, where there's, you know, there's no real, there's no pressure on your appreciation, your Mm -hmm. IRRs go up and all that stuff. But interestingly, like in the last six months, and it'll ebb and flow, but you can, you know, we've heard that you can buy at the same cap rate in Salt Lake City as we've been compressed as you could buy in Southern California. And so a lot of those buyers would say, well, why would I sell and buy in Salt Lake when I can sell and buy, buy in LA? And that's, I would say that's just kind of a recent tweak. I would say that there's definitely an argument that you should move your money. You know, Salt Lake City has a lot of upside. Uh, we anticipate, you know, this last year we've had 17% rent growth. We anticipate anywhere from, you know, I'd say 10 to 15% rent growth over the next 12 months. Um, but it really just depends on what the seller profile is and what they want to do with their equity. Obviously, your market's not going anywhere. My wife's from Huntington Beach. And if she had her choice, you know, we'd move back to Southern California. So it's a great market. It'll always be there. Um, but there are some political headwinds that I think, you know, people are benefiting from moving their dollars here, but there has been a little bit of slowdown in the 1031 exchange market. This market is a, a stalwart. It'll it'll always be here and it'll always serve investors in a certain way. But where I've seen, and, and you've been the benefactor or the receiver of, it's like over here, I mean, you've heard the saying, like, how do you boil a frog, right? I mean, if you put yeah. a frog in the boiling water, it jumps out. But if you just heat the water slowly, and a lot of us over here in California feel like that that water's been heating up over time. We, we definitely, uh, we are the benefactors of it. I mean, I loved the, the Texas and Utah shirts that said Gavin Newsom was the, you know, the, the number one real estate agent in those states the last couple of years. Those are, those are pretty funny. And with the strides in the rent growth, I mean, what do you think the government reaction is that you get to uh, protest from the tenant base, obviously, as you would, no matter where you are, what's the posture of the government over there, state, local, is there any talk about rent control? Like, is there is there anything you're concerned about from the government legislative side? You know, that's a great question. And this could be a whole separate four hour podcast because I sit <laughs> on many of the affordable housing boards here. And I know that housing affordability has been a hot button in every market for the last you know decade, if not more. But it's really starting to get spicy the last three, four, five years because it's reading it's hitting a total litmus test. I mean, we are becoming and we are. Never mind. We have passed the point of no return. We are a nation of renters. And this is where the, 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 the Wall Street side of me says, buy apartments in Long Beach, buy apartments in, in Denver, buy apartments in Salt Lake City. You'll never build your way out of it. As we've seen construction costs rise above replacement costs, you know, you're never going to build a $300,000 unit and rent it to seven, for $700. It's just never going to happen. You're not going to solve the affordable housing crisis. So <laughs> the reason you're seeing all of these huge groups buy these single family rental communities and Instead of building out 100 homes to sell to people, they're going to build out 100 homes and rent them and own them as an investment vehicle is because no one is saving enough money to buy a home. So buy apartments. That's why we're on this podcast. Now, the other side of me is freaked out because when you go to tour these properties and these are hardworking Americans, I make car parts for American working men and women because that's who I am. and That's who I care about. Uh, it's really sad because you just know that they're not going to get on, you know, what we would call in the affordable housing world, the equity ladder, right? They're never going to, you're not going to save your way fast enough working at a low end, you know, or or minimum wage job in order to save enough to buy a house when the market's increasing three, five, eight, 10, 20% year over year. 
And so I think what I'm concerned about from like a, you know, 50,000 foot standpoint is just the fact that people can't, they won't be able to afford these rental increases. And what happens when the vast majority hits that from a policy standpoint, I, I'm not afraid of Utah. We're, we're a cowboy state. You know, we, we have a lot of, we respect landlord rights. Uh, I think that it's a very basic contract and I may get, you know, awful hate mail emails from this, but if you agree to pay a certain amount and live at a certain place between you and the, the landlord, you have a contract, right? And if you couldn't afford to pay that or if something changes, you know, I do appreciate what's happened certainly through COVID. Um, but, but stepping in and saying, hey, you can't raise your rents more than 7% year over year. And, you know, you, you, whatever, just telling somebody that owns a property that they're no longer able to do something that they initially intended to do. I mean, that's a really hard thing, right? Is it their fault or is it the economy's fault? Is it the government's fault for pumping a bunch of money? And is it policy? Is it whatever? So, I mean, it's just a, it's just a tough, a tough situation. And I don't know what the answer is, but I'm certainly doing everything I can on the boards and I'm on and the affordable communities that we're building. And we actually started something really interesting in Utah based on some really amazing uh, people in our market that have put money into this fund, but it's called the Utah Preservation Fund. And now I'm talking way too long, so I'll make it brief. They are buying apartments not to renovate them and to not increase rents to at least keep some of the stock here somewhat affordable. And we're doing everything we can to keep Utah's affordability in check. No, I, I totally appreciate that. And, and everything you're saying is, is ringing out as, as, as a lot of logic. So, you know, I'm, I'm here to listen to you talk. So don't worry about that. <laughs> okay. Here's, here's my concern. And, and this is, typical and and for a developer just intuitive is most of the housing stock that you see brought on is class a if if not class b right so yeah we've got a huge workforce need over here that's that's definitely not being addressed it's just too far below the the mason dixon line for somebody to want to build that they got rid of uh redevelopment here in california some time back and so you do wonder how does that gap get filled because i totally agree with you is, is however we landed here we are a nation of renters now right and in california the problem is is these these guys uh, i could use much more creative and uh expletive <laughs> ways to describe politically them. politically incorrect ways yeah they they don't really give a rat's ass about the well-being of the entire group, right? What are they, what are they looking for to get reelected, right? So if, if you're looking to get reelected and I'm not going to go down the political wormhole here, but if you're, if you're looking to get reelected, you're going to cater to your, your voter base. That's going to vote for you. And, and here in California, it's for sure landlords are in a, in a definitely minority position. So what's the incentive for them to, to want to balance the supply and demand? Because Look, you and I both went to college and we had Econ 101. And if, if you need supply of something, you, you, you add the supply and then you balance it out. There's, a, there's, there's an equilibrium, right? So if yep. you had that here in California, they wouldn't make it so freaking hard to build, to build anything, right? So if they wanted to, to, to balance supply and demand in housing, they could. They could let normal people build duplexes or, or build smaller apartment buildings without putting so much red tape and cost in front of it, it just doesn't make sense right now one thing i'll tell you that they've done over here that i do like it came from the state level so i'm not really used to hearing them put out ideas that like make sense and, <laughs> and help people i don't know if you've heard of what an adu is adu is an accessory dwelling unit and what they've allowed over here, and it's and it's going gangbusters, and it's like a way to add supplies. They're saying, okay, if you have a an apartment building like I do, I have an eight unit building with a single story garage building next to it. They're making it real easy for you to go add some units on top of those garages, convert garages into living units. Like they've actually made that easy, and and obviously owner loves it you're gonna you're gonna get uh some an equity buildup that was an easy way to add equity 
by putting these two units on. But that's a drop in the bucket, right? Because we're still millions of doors short of having the right number of houses. Putting that into the lens of Utah, I was interviewing some people over there and reading, do you have like a landmass issue between where the mountains start running west to out where the watershed is? How constrained are you with with land to develop on? And if my intuition serves me correctly, the second part of the question is, which direction would it go? Would it continue north or go south, assuming like the little strip in the middle is probably going to be built out without too much time going by? Yeah. And in fact, I've read reports that say that Salt Lake City is the 37th most dense city in the U.S., which sounds kind of crazy. But we are basically 2 million people in a 100-mile stretch that's no wider than 8 miles north and south with mountain ranges on both sides and lakes mm -hmm. on both sides. So we definitely have physical constraints. You know, the next 5 to 10 years, that's going to get pushed out. We do have Tooele County. We've got a few areas in Weber and Davis County that can still absorb some development. We're getting pushed into Springville and Payson and, you know, some of the southern markets in Utah County. So you'll, you'll see that, but you'll also start to see a lot more urban, urban growth. And similarly, on the policy side, we're, we have a lot of issues getting new units approved in our market. So to, to kind of come full circle on the affordable housing, a big component or big pro product of that, if we're going to solve it, it's got to come from the city or come from the state from approvals. I mean, it can't take two years to get, you know, denied. Like you could have denied us on the first day or you could approve us on the, on the eighth day. But one of our largest home builders is pretty well known for saying that, you know, housing affordability issues, it's a supply issue. It's not a demand issue. We, we've always known we've been growing. You know, we know that the U.S. has positive net in-migration. But when you stop allowing for development, what do you expect? You know, we're, this is our self-fulfilling prophecy. We did it to ourselves with the nimbyism, not in my backyard. And, and I'm here now and I don't want anyone else to come here. It just creates, you know, creates these issues. But we'll see it continued growth in Utah. We do have areas to grow, but we're not like a Phoenix or a Dallas where it's like, you know, I went to I went my freshman year to Boulder, Colorado and Denver. And now I go back to Denver. And when they first built the airport, it was in the middle of nowhere. And now it's like everything's kind of connected out there. But you can continue to go, you know, east to Nebraska. So we do not have those those luxury. We don't have the luxury of land. We're kind of like that here. You know, we're built out. Everything you're going to see around Long Beach and and for sure, most of L.A. County is going to be infill stuff, which is obviously huge. But, you know, we're not a we're not an open uh, mass of land just waiting to be built upon. And even yeah. if we did have that, you, you've still got this government overreach that just makes it cost prohibitive in a lot of cases to build anything. You and I have been around a long time. I mean, as far as a couple cycles, we've seen heydays and we've seen a couple uh, tougher times. And, it, you know, we've all read the real estate cycle kind of runs eight to 12 years in a certain direction, at least in the uptrend maybe not as deep as the last great recession. It's a little yeah. like the stock market. I feel like people that I talk to and just what I read, it feels like on both sectors, that being the S&P 500 or apartments or single family homes that right about now, everybody feels like it can never come down. It seems like not that long after it does. <laughs> what do you think is in store for the market overall? Do we, do we have a correction? Does that affect a place like Salt Lake City that heavily or Long Beach? I mean, when do you see a place where you as a buyer, just using you as a hypothetical buyer, where you go, I need to see a five to 10% correction before I buy some more units. Like, what do, what's that looking like for you? Because I'm scratching my head over here going, I thought COVID would have handled that already. Right when COVID hit, I thought, oh, okay, here's our little mild recession we're going to go into. And the market over here knee jerk for about I don't know, let's say 60 days, and it just sort of popped right back up on its trend. What do you think about the market inflection possibility sometimes? Yeah, I mean, that's a, an awesome question. And and it's different this time, or like, you know, some of the most dangerous words you can you can speak, right? So, I mean, it'd be really fun to do kind of investor sentiment. But I would tell you based on, you know, if I were to say I'm not very smart, but I'm the New York Stock Exchange of the multifamily market in Utah, Everybody has their, you know, they're putting their buy, their their money into buy right now. So I would say mm -hmm. that the market feedback is that Salt Lake City is going to continue to grow. You know, we did see a pullback similar to you, 60, 90 days in Salt Lake City, but it wasn't like price went down. It basically meant that we weren't seeing any transactions because sellers were like, whatever, like it's still cash flowing. So here, here's what I would say. We are going to continue to be full of people. And they're going to continue to pay rent to live in those houses. If there's going to be an issue, it's going to be the economy. 
you know, it's going to be jobs. It's going to be bigger than, than any sort of secular issue like we had in 2009 and 10 in real estate. The difference this go around is there's heads on beds. I mean, I worked on deal that were deals where they were absolutely speculative, right? Guy that owns a, you know, that delivers pizza owns three houses on the street. And you're thinking like, well, that doesn't quite connect. Hindsight's mm-hmm. 2020. I'm not sure I put that together back then. Um, but, but now there's, there's definitely people in these units. I mean, we were 98 and a half percent occupied in our market with, with continued rent growth. And we, in the, every time we jump rents every year, we're not seeing occupancy go down. So I, you know, I don't know what the crystal ball is. I would say that the only time you, you make or lose money is when you buy and sell. So if you're just going to hold, I don't, you know, you're not going to have any issues in our market. If you go back, you know, if you've held for 10 years in our market, any 10 years you looked at, you made money. Play the long game is what I'd say. But I also tell clients right now, you know, similarly what they tell you in the, in the stock market, like stop playing on all these possibly inflated tech stocks, you know, go after companies that are producing products that they sell those products to people and make a profit. And that's what real estate is. We have a housing product that we give to people to stay in and we make a, we make a profit. And if you just hang on to those in the long term, you'll be, you know, super successful. In a hot market where you're seeing parabolic appreciation, maybe you can get in and opportunistically do some short-term holds, kind of like the stock market, right? It all it, it all kind yeah. of parallels each other at some point. Sure. You, could, you could look at that. Over here, bought in 2007 at the top of the market. It's like the sky's falling in 2010. It's like, just shut up and hold on. Like you're just manage yeah. your building. Yeah, you got a, a little higher vacancy, but it was never like it was in Texas in 2010. Everyone's crying in their beer over here because it was it was five to seven percent vacancy. And I'd send these people an article about parts of Texas that everyone thought was kind of hot, that it was like 30 percent. I go, you guys, it's all relative, right? You're used to having zero vacancy. Now you have five to seven and the sky is falling. But all you're going to do is just hold your Hold your building, manage it nicely. And obviously we've eclipsed those 2007 prices at this point. So it's, it's all perspective that we carry into these equations. Yep. I want to ask you one more question, but let me tell you about our firm, WSC Realty Advisors and WSC Property Management. WSC has been helping buyers and sellers and managing properties in Long Beach for 15 years. As I mentioned earlier, in fact, our 15 year anniversary was actually just this last week. If you're tired of managing or just not getting the results you want, we're running our fall special sign up for management services before December 31st and come aboard with no setup fee. And your first two months are free. And we can also help you if you're looking to acquire more units or maybe an exchange scenario to an out-of-state market like Utah. Visit wsc-pm.com or call, text, or email us. Uh, all our information's in the show notes. I'll also have contact information for our guest today in there as well. So if you want to talk more about Utah multifamily, I'm sure he'd be glad to to take care of that. Whatever your challenge with your property is, we've definitely got a solution here at WSC Realty Advisors. Uh, One last quick question for you. You're getting buyers from California. You're getting them from Colorado and maybe even further away. What would you say are, are maybe a couple of the biggest challenges facing Well, not just new owners, right? Because everybody's got, like we just talked about, perspective of where they're at, what they're doing. And now I'm going to go over here and do the same thing. And, oh, wait, that's different or that's different. The differences that mentally somebody would need to have over in Utah. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. And every market is different. And I've never, I mean, I'm sort of jealous. You were saying you drove this market. You've been to other markets. You know, I've never done an acquisition in another market. I've done dispositions in other markets. Um, but, but there are nuances, right. And having the right local management company and the right team in place and the right broker, you know, can definitely help. One of the issues people have in our market is we're like a Texas where we're a non-disclosure state. So when you came to this market and you looked at all these properties, you were like, you know, what do you do? Do I go to CoStar, which we don't share with CoStar (laughs) because that's our value. So we're a non-disclosure state. You really don't know what stuff trades at, but I do, you know, 40 ish percent of the trades in the market. And so I trade with all the other brokerage houses and and independent buyers and sellers. So we try to get a hundred percent of the trades every single year. Um, but, But that also means that property taxes are different here. So I'd say the biggest challenge that we have or new buyers have to our market is just making sure that they're underwriting the correct property taxes and how they adjust in our market versus, Mm. you know, adjusting on the sale, like a California. And there's a few other nuances that I'd say, you know, valuating and underwriting a true year one NOI is really, you know, a a huge value add that we can help provide um, as you come here and property taxes are probably the most discussed item. That is interesting because I I haven't come across that before in the, let's say four or five other markets. And I'm just pulling my hair out going, wait a minute here. You're not, you can't even find out 
because I'm a data guy. I'm an Excel geek, and I, I've tracked every sale in Long Beach for 10 years. <laughs> And I've got this real nice spreadsheet that really sometimes I figure like I'm the only one that appreciates, but I went over there and I'm like, wait a minute. So, so obviously having that data is, is just pure value sitting in your, in your computer, which is cool. You, you like to think that, I mean, I've tracked sales since 2004, buyer, seller, in place, income, T1, T3, T6, T12, year one, NOI. Um, but sometimes it matters and sometimes it doesn't. I have to have it when I'm consulting on valuations or I'm consulting on somebody coming into the market. Uh, I'd like to think it's valuable, but to your point, I may just be a, a total data nerd, but I have every sale. So if you're looking for help in the Utah market, I'm a good guy to know for sure. So if you have any more curiosities, as I mentioned in the earlier part of the show, uh, we'll have the, the contact information for Mr. Jensen here. Call him, email him if you're curious about Utah. It's a wonderful market. Uh, I drove around for a few days. It, it, it feels really comfortable. There's a lot of exciting stuff going on there. There's a market there that's growing and, and growing at a pace that is hard to keep up with the demand. And if you're looking to buy apartments out of state, how could you want to go anywhere else, right? So I appreciate it, Mark. Thank you for being here today. This has been the Everything Apartments podcast. I'm your host, Eric Christopher. Thank you for listening and stay tuned for another episode coming soon.